Well, collectors, uh, here we are again. Uh, we're going to do something a little different this time that uh, may please some of you and uh, may not please others uh, because it's a relatively small part of um, collecting. Uh, but we're going to talk about silver and tableware today. Uh, I've gotten several emails from uh, collectors uh, wanting to see my uh, AH uh, silver collection. So uh, about 98% of everything that you will be seeing today is, um, is part of my collection. And uh, it's taken me many, many years uh, to accumulate the pieces that I have, uh, most of them one by one, year by year. But I, I've also gotten um, emails from collectors in the past that say, uh, what are you doing selling that silverware? That's not military. Uh, and I, you know, I thought about it for a long time. And uh, I just, I disagree with that. And I, I just wrote a, uh, uh, just a little, my thought of, um, you know, what is military? Uh, and my thoughts were that it's um, any artifact that was used by, worn by, or owned by a military official or party official during a time of war. Now, some of you may want to challenge that um, explanation, but I, I think that it is, um, uh, it does encompass uh, tableware because, let's face it, everybody had to eat. Uh, and in the days of the Third Reich, of course, the, uh, the government had an obligation to promote themselves in the best manner possible with the diplomatic corps, the Berghof, Reich Chancellery, etc. So um, making a good appearance was, um, was always um, a proper thing. Now in, uh, in this country, you know, we, we Americans, uh, most of us, we, we use a knife and a fork and, uh, and that's kind of about it. Uh, if you go into a restaurant today, uh, even a good restaurant, uh, you sit down to dinner, there'll be a knife, a fork, and a spoon usually at your place setting. And uh, if you order an appetizer, uh, you eat the appetizer, and the, the waiter comes along and, and takes the appetizer and says, Oh, leave your, leave your fork and knife here and put your dirty fork back in, in your plate. Uh, Marie always gets offended at that. My wife, uh, she always asks for clean utensils, which the waiters, uh, uh, you can see, uh, who's this broad? But um, in the days of the Third Reich, and of course, 100, more than 100 years before that, um, uh, the art of uh, serving dinner was established in Europe, mostly. Uh, and during the Victorian times and so forth, uh, they had many, many different utensils uh, that were designed for different parts of the meal. And normally in a really fine restaurant, um, once you're done one course, let's say you're going to have four or five or six courses sometimes, once you're done one course, uh, the waiter comes along and takes your plate and, and uh, also takes, well I should say before you start the course, he'll bring the utensils that are required for that particular meal and then take them away when the meal's finished. So that's why in some cases you'll see four or five um, uh, eating tools lined up on each side of your plate. Uh, I remember once I went to a, uh, a very, very sophisticated wedding uh, it was in the Helmsley Palace in New York. Maybe some of you remember Mrs. Helmsley that thought she was the queen of hotels and she had these fabulous places. But the wedding was formal and uh, everybody had to wear a tuxedo just to go to the wedding. And when we got to the reception in the hotel, it was like I was saying, there was all these utensils all side, beside the plate. and. Uh, 
and I'm looking at them all kind of scratching my head and I looked around my table there was about eight people at the table and I see them all looking and, uh, and I thought well I may as well break the ice on this and I said hey does anybody know what this stuff is for and they all laughed and uh, nobody really knew what uh, half the utensils were for so we all decided we'd make a pack that we would use all use the same utensil for that certain course so the waiter wouldn't have the nerve to say it was <laughs> the wrong thing because there were too many people that were wrong, but it, it, it worked out. But anyhow, on, on that uh, format, uh, I'm going to start uh, talking about um, uh, some of the uh, flatware uh, that was used at the uh, Berghof as well as um, other places where Hitler resided. And, um, there were two uh, patterns of uh, flatware, um, which we incorrectly call the formal pattern and the informal pattern. These are just names that were assigned, uh, but because uh, you know how we are with collectors, certain things we call certain things, and that's it. And uh, so they, uh, those names have uh, have kind of stuck. Um, so the formal pattern. Uh, was of course for uh, dinners. Uh, what we call the informal pattern was mostly for uh, breakfast and lunch. And although the informal pattern is much, much rarer, it does not bring the same price as the formal pattern because it just doesn't have the wow factor uh, in the design. Uh, and I'll show you that as we go along. So first, we're going to look at some um, uh, formal pattern flatware. All right, collectors, we're going to start with uh, formal pattern uh, AH flatware. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the flatware was all made by a company named Brookman, uh, and it was um, made of 800 silver. So you say, well, what the heck does that mean? Well, 800 silver uh, if you think of the forms of percentages, a thousand would be pure silver, but if you tried to use a fork that was pure silver, it would bend in half, so they had to put another type of metal in with the silver to strengthen it. So 800 meant that it was 80% silver. Um, they could have used 925, which even is a higher content, but Hitler didn't find that that was practical. Um, but it was used by uh, Ribbentrop, for instance, again, for making an impression. So, the stuff that we see at the uh, Berghof, uh, these utensils that run from here to here, here, and stop here, uh, were the basic things that were used at the, the Berghof. And you'll see they had a, a larger knife for dinner and a smaller knife for salad and an even smaller knife for like a relish dish. And that followed through with the size of the forks and the spoon for uh, a little bit of, um, of uh, coffee. Um, so they were, and they all had a design which I don't know which the camera would pick up best. Maybe if you look at this design, uh, you will see that there's a political eagle with half open wings clutching a swastika. Uh, and on each side uh, of the talons or the wreath uh, is the monogram AH. And then if you turn the item over, uh, the silver markings, the hole markings will be there uh, and what they consist of is a, um, a crescent, um, let's see, a crescent, a, uh, an eagle, 800, uh, and then a crown. And they, that was the traditional silver hallmarks that were used in, uh, in Germany uh, by flatware makers. So you can see there was quite an assortment here of... Uh, of utensils, and this by no means includes all of them because there are, are probably another uh, dozen or so that I don't have here in my personal collection. 
but just to give you an idea, that this is pretty easy to guess. It's a gravy ladle. Uh, this is called an aspic server. You say, ah, what the heck's aspic? Well, aspic is actually gelatin. Uh, the Germans really liked a, uh, um, a clear gelatin with um, pig's knuckles in it. Um, my grandmother used to make it all the time, and um, um, it, it, we used to call it in our family, it was called souse. But I've heard it called head cheese in restaurants. And um, usually if you order something like that, you could be sure that your wife or girlfriend is going to be really disgusted. How can you eat something like that? Oh, but it was a traditional um, German dish. Uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, my father... Uh, he always, uh, if I was in trouble with something or uh, whatever, he'd say, well, can't you go see the man and schmaltz him up? And, uh, you know, I always wondered what schmaltz was. Uh, and when I got older, I, uh, uh, a number of years ago when I was in Germany, I saw schmaltz on the menu. And so I ordered it, and it turned out to be really just a plate, a plate of lard, uh, but it's another great German dish that apparently was considered a real delicacy. So if you were going to schmaltz somebody up, that meant you were going to give him some schmaltz that everybody liked. So, so this is what the this utensil was. This is a um, kind of a meat fork. Um, this is a special uh, set for um, uh, a salad. Um, this is a tough one to find. Uh, I don't know whether you guys can guess what that is or not, but if you've ever eaten uh, a lobster, uh, you know it's pretty hard to get the meat out of those legs and claws, so this was uh, designed for lobster eating. Um, we call this a, uh, a fish knife. Uh, the Germans had a lot of um, fish courses, and this knife lent, lent well to that. Uh, some people say, no, nah, that's wrong, it was to spread butter. I really have never been able to find out which explanation is correct. And these are the demi toss pieces, the uh, uh, normal salad fork and the normal dinner fork. And uh, the Germans liked the big spoon, too. Uh, there was no, no messing around when you were eating. That was a, that was a good thing. Uh, and this uh, smaller spoon... You notice it has kind of an odd shape. Uh, that was designed for bouillon. Uh, the Germans like to serve bouillon before dinner. And this odd looking uh, piece that's half spoon and half fork was designed for eating an oyster. You know, you could stick the fork in and get the oyster free of the shell and then it would last in the spoon. Uh, and this type of fork is known as a cake fork. It's got one bigger size tine uh, with a a cut 45 degree edge on it. So those are those are the um, the basic pieces. Oh, and of course you had the um, uh, the sugar tongs. Uh, these are very very difficult to find. Uh, they're interesting because they have the same pattern as the flatware uh, on both sides with the eagle and the ah. Uh, and they're also 800 mark, just like everything else. Um, but with with these things, um, it's just like anything else. If you have uh, an SA dagger uh, and a chained SS dagger, uh, they're both daggers, but the chained SS is much rarer than the SA. So if you think about with these um, serving utensils, uh, how many, um, for instance, um, salad mixing tools would you have? Maybe one or two per table, depending on how large the setting was. And the same is true of um, sugar tongs, um, the aspic server. There's not going to maybe one or two of those, one or two um, gravy boat ladles, um, and so it goes. So. These kind of serving pieces um, can cost three or even four times what the standard pieces were because only so many of them were made. Um, 
We don't know how many pieces were made of the AH silver, uh, but we think about 3,000. So that gives everybody a pretty good shot at uh, maybe getting one. A lot of collectors write me, I don't want to collect AH silver, but I would just like to have one piece for my collection. So they'll buy a knife, a fork, or a spoon, or all three, that kind of thing. Whereas there are a number of us out there that are uh, trying to find uh, uh, each piece that was produced, and that's a that's really a uh, that's a tough job, very tough job. Um, I also want to show you that was the formal pattern, and I'll show you what the uh, the so-called informal pattern was all about. Okay, collectors, uh, we're going to uh, talk about the so-called informal pattern now again, and uh, that was used for breakfast and lunch. And I'm going to show you some pieces here. Um, these are all informal, and um, except for what are called the grape schnips, um, I was able to purchase all of these pieces uh, back in the middle 1970s uh, when I met a young man in the uh, parking lot of a diner in Cherry Hill, which is a town near here. And at the time, uh, uh, silver uh, was being turned in for the value of it so that people would uh, you know, they get it melded and uh, whatever. Um, so he met me in the parking lot and he had all this stuff. And uh, at the time, I had no clue what it was because I had never, never seen anything like it before. Uh, and he says, well, it's got a, uh, an eagle and a swastika on it and the initials of some hotel. And I said, oh, must be the uh, Ambassador Hotel or something, A-H, oh, I don't know. And I said, well, I don't know either, but um, uh, how about I'll give you the, um, the silver value of it because I don't know what it's worth. And, and he says, that's fine. So we, we figured about 50 bucks a piece, and that's what I, I bought the flatware uh, for. But, uh, of course, later when I started to to get AH silver from veterans and so forth, I, I started to realize that there were two different patterns. Um, and when we look at the, um, the so-called informal pattern, let's see, let's pick out something you can see good. If you look at that eagle uh, and compare it with the eagle on this piece, uh, you can see that there's there's big differences. Uh, see how uh, raised out and beautiful the uh, uh, the pattern all is there, and then it has the chain link pattern that goes around the handle. Whereas the informal has no detail to the ego ego at all. It's just almost a a silhouette. Still has the A H and so forth, and there's no. Greek link pattern going around it. So those are the basic differences. The, the, um, the informal is still marked the same with the 800 and the crescent and the eagle and the whatnot. So, so that's what you see with those, with those things. Um, the, um, as I said, the informal is more difficult to obtain but does not bring the value uh, that the formal does. Um, a pair of um, grape snips like this is, um, is extremely rare. Uh, if a set of flatware was ordered, uh, uh, in particular I have a copy of an invoice uh, for flatware uh, that was ordered for uh, the eagle's nest, you know, up on top of the mountain. Uh, and there were only two grape schmidt. Schnitz, grape schnitz, snips, according to that order. Boy, I need more to drink. Um, so they're, they're really rare, and um, uh, just the grape snips alone will, will bring seven or eight thousand dollars. So that's a, that's a pretty, pretty husky, uh, pretty husky price. 
Um, but the same forks and knives basically uh, were produced, but they didn't have all the serving pieces like they had in the, uh, in the formal. Uh, at least I don't think so because I've never found uh, any of the larger pieces. Uh, this invoice, though, does list everything that was produced. So, with that, uh, I want to just go through some um, some photographs of uh, of AH flatware uh, that were provided me uh, by a. a a friend of mine, I've never met him, but I've corresponded with him for years, Matthew Solis from uh, Australia. He has a magnificent AH flatware collection. And you can see here's some of his serving pieces. There's the aspic and the, the meat and the so forth. Uh, uh, here's, um, uh, they call this a tomato knife. That's a very, very rare item. Uh, I've only had one over the years, and I should have kept it, but I sold it. Maybe that's where he got that one. I don't know. Uh, these are the um, uh, salad-type servers. These are salad. These are not salad. These are actually uh, uh, a garnish server and a cold-cut server. See how they're shaped? And it looks like an oyster fork, but it's much bigger. Uh, very rare stuff here. Um, I'm not sure what these are. He told me, but I neglected to write it down. But again, ultra rare patterns. These are ultra rare. This is a, a, a cake serving fork, and that's a, a gravy ladle. Um, very, very hard to find these kind of things. Here's a pair of um, grape schnips in the formal pattern. The ones I showed you are in the informal pattern. Very, very rare. It's neat how they just, they took the scissor part, stuck it into the AH knife handle type thing, and put two uh, circular metal pieces on the bottom and soldered that on, and it just, uh, it's, <laughs> it's typical German. Uh, we'll, we'll make it, but we'll do it the, uh, the, the most practical way possible, and that's what they did. Uh, again, uh, highly um, rare pieces. Here's the, the, uh, the lobster fork, and this is some type of a, uh, I don't know, pickle or something. This is for iced tea or ice cream. Again, a whole three sizes of uh, different, I mean, they had forks for strawberries, for God's sake. So uh, this is a great one if you could ever find it. Um, uh, I've had a couple over the years. This is the asparagus server. You know, the asparagus would fall within and be uh, held in place by this cap on the end. Very, very rare piece and very, very desirable. And not many around, of course. Um, these are the pieces that uh, involved uh, tobacco. Uh, this is uh, a Hitler uh, cigar cutter, a uh, match cover and a cigarette box and I can show you from my personal collection this is what the cigar cutter looked like it has the same formal pattern and it has the same chain link design Greek chain link design that goes around it and you if you have a big cigar you put it in the top if you have a smaller cigar you put it in here and you press the lever and that cuts the cigar uh, very rare pieces and very very desirable especially if you smoke cigars like me. So that's, that's what they look like. And uh, uh, here's a good, um, that's a shot of the cigarette box inside, pictured next to a cutter. This is the uh, match cover box with the AH Eagle on the top. And uh, it had a slot here so that the place where you strike the matches could be uh, accessible. Uh, there was a box of matches slipped in this end. Remember those big boxes our grandmothers used to have to light the gas stove with the big wood matches? That's what they used. Uh, that's a shot of the uh, cigarette box. Again, the chain link design went around it. 
these were not made by um, Bruckner, though. They were made by WMF, uh, a Bavarian uh, silver producer. That's a shot of an AH uh, cigar cutter. Uh, this is a, a shot of the reverse of some really rare uh, utensils. That's the sugar tongs, like I just showed you, what they look like close up. Remember, it's two identical pieces like that. Uh, this is a, a shot of uh, Matthew Solis' uh, collection uh, with all of the items. Uh, you say, well, <laughs> look at all that, knives and forks, you know. And you think, oh, you have no idea what that's worth. <laughs> it's worth a fortune. There's some close-ups of the, uh, the, the matchbox and the cigarette box. Close-up of the eagle on top. Uh, beautifully done. And the chain link, you can really see how... I've seen reproductions of these boxes, and the chain link design is never done as deeply as it is on the originals. And the eagle is some eagle they took from something else and put it on there, so whatever. But, and this is the markings that you want to see on them. The FHW 925, it was almost pure silver, and then the German hallmarks with the crescent and the crown. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the hallmarks that you'll see on all of the um, silver pieces on the back. There's the, the crown, the uh, crescent, the crown, and the eagle, 800. But you'll notice here the eagle looks a little faded. So that's something I want to talk about for just a second. With um, collectors always asking me, uh, should I clean the items? Well, uh, you own the items, so you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, but every time you clean something, although it's hardly anything, you're removing a certain amount of the detail and the finish from the piece. And uh, I do not clean anything. I mean, you look at my silverware, and maybe you think, ah, it really looks crappy. Uh, but I know it's all shiny if I want to shine it up. I don't need to shine it because I know it's shiny underneath the patina. But I don't want to lose any of the detail from my silverware. So this is, this is what can happen with, um, with too much cleaning. And uh, that's just the, um, uh, the hallmarks. But you're doing the same thing to the eagle and, and uh, the AH uh, monogram. So... In my opinion, I think that silver should be left alone. Again, you can do what you want. You own the stuff. Uh, there's a cigar cutter. Uh, another shot of a, of a great cigar box. Very beautiful. And uh, this next shot, uh, this is the fabulous uh, coffee and tea set that was used at the Berghof. I sold this set about three years ago. It was still in mint condition, uh, and it's magnificent with the coffee pot, the teapot, uh, the uh, sugar, and the creamer. And each part has the um, political eagle with the monogram on it. Um, just recently, uh, someone sent me a coffee pot like this uh, to sell for them, uh, and it had the, uh, the AH Eagle and so forth, and I looked at it, and I, I looked at it a long time, and I could see where the Eagle was engraved, not rolled. And what I mean by that is that uh, Wellner, who made these table pieces, uh, when they put the monogram and the eagle on the piece, it was done be when the piece was just straight sheet metal before it was formed. And they had a, a die machine with a blank on it that had the, um, the monogram and, and eagle on it. And the die was pressed down and it was rolled with great pressure against the metal. So you never want to see, on a Wellner piece like this, 
something engraved. It was always rolled. And I'll try to show you what rolled looks like uh, a little while along in the uh, lecture. It's very, very important because a, uh, uh, an AH coffee pot's worth ten to twelve thousand dollars. And wouldn't it be a shame if you bought one that somebody got in a flea market in Europe that was made by Wellner and had the local jeweler engrave that all on there? Your ten thousand bucks went out the window. So you don't want to make you don't want to make a mistake like that. I know uh, some of these forums all the time. They're always after me. I don't know why. <laughs> Nobody does what I do for the hobby, but they're always after me. Oh, that Whitman, there he is stamping that eagle and swastika again on that tray. And, you know, this, I mean, it just, um, it's, it's very disheartening to me. Um, and if you know what a rolled uh, uh, image is supposed to look like, uh, they're the ones that are, that are fools. Uh, and, uh, but anyhow, we'll get, we'll get into that more of but that was, uh, that was a glorious set there that I enjoyed owning for the time it took to sell it, which wasn't long, only a month or so. And the set sold, if I remember correctly, for about $27,000, so uh, pretty nice. This was the tray that it, that it was on, and it's, a, it's a, also AH. Uh, there, here, this is how the tray's marked. Now, if you look at that, You'll see no signs of, you know, engraving, there's always one thing's longer than the other, little mistakes here and there when you look at it on a loop. No such thing with rolled pieces. Everything is completely uh, identical throughout it. No high spots, low spots, things sticking out, nothing like that. It's absolutely perfect. And this is what we want to see on, the, on these pieces. Can you see that? As I said, the serving pieces were made by Wellner. And uh, you look at it and you, and you see um, uh, 75 underneath. You go, oh, what, what the heck is that? Um, Wellner had stock numbers for all the pieces that they made. Um, the pieces that they made for Hitler, they also sold to the general public, but of course they weren't uh, uh, done with the, uh, the pressed um, eagle and so forth. Um, this is a really a great document here. Um, this is actually uh, the translated order that was received by Brookman uh, for the flatware that was required at the eagle's nest. Not the Berghoff, it would have been a much higher order, but this was at the eagle's nest. And what's great about it, you can um, uh, now tell what all of the pieces were because they're translated into English. And it also shows you the uh, quantity uh, that, was, that were produced. Um, things like, um, they are cigar cutters. There were only two of them um, uh, made up in, uh, for the, uh, uh, the eagle's nest. Uh, four cigarette boxes, two cigar boxes, four candle holders. So you can see these kind of items are quite rare, whereas there were 36 tablespoons and 36 of a lot of other things, 72 coffee spoons. So you, so you can see, and if you take those same figures and apply them to the Berghoff, uh, the quantity that was ordered was, was huge. But this is an absolute invaluable document uh, that the original authenticates uh, the silverware. Uh, people have said, oh, how do you know that that's original? Uh, the one great thing about uh, collecting AH flatware is that um, for the most part, it is never reproduced. And that's because the flatware was, the whole utensil was stamped out with these huge dies, and that's what gives it the great relief. Um, the only reproductions I've ever seen with AH uh, silverware are the little, um, 
little tiny spoons. And you can tell right away because somebody casted them. And when you have something in a mold, it never comes out like a bang, uh, stamping from a, from a big die. So that's a good thing to remember. Um, okay, on that we'll go to another topic. Okay, before I leave the AH uh, flatware, I just want to talk about a couple more items here. Um, this is a uh, uh, an AH monogram napkin. Uh, it's beautiful cotton, and the um, the monogram was all uh, done uh, by a woman. Probably they must have had a great crochet girl there. Uh, and these napkins were used uh, probably for lunch and dinner, cocktails, that sort of thing. They did have a larger uh, formal uh, pattern uh, that was all white, uh, but I don't have one to uh, show you. Um, and along with it, you'll see on, on this um, format of what was ordered from the, uh, for the Eagle's Nest, they, they mention... Um, uh, toothpick holders. They had two of them, and uh, this is a, a toothpick holder. Um, a lot of times I show people this thing and say, what is it? And they don't know. Uh, but if you know what it is, it's pretty obvious. You stick your finger in there and pull the toothpick out, and, it, and it's marked on both sides with the um, uh, political eagle. I've never seen one that had an AH monogram on it, and I'm not sure whether they even made one that way. And then another item that uh, uh, there's there's been a lot of uh, um, arguments and uh, people say no and uh, uh, about the existence of um, napkin holders uh, for the formal flatware. Uh, there are napkin holders that are known, and uh, some people believe them, some people don't believe them. So when you get into controversy, I stay away from it until I can uh, find the, the answer. Uh, but this is a, a napkin ring uh, that was probably uh, produced uh, for a silver set for Hitler prior uh, to the, uh, the Reich set. And uh, I believe that this is a uh, original example. It's um, beautifully done, and it also has, um, I believe, uh, silver hallmarks on it somewhere here. Yeah, right in here are the, the silver hallmarks. And it's the only one I've ever seen. Uh, I haven't been able to document it, but uh, I do believe that it is a... Uh, a genuine example. So with that, we're going to now talk about the um, uh, items that we find from the Reich Chancellery, which was in Berlin. And um, as you collectors know, uh, the Russians were the ones that, uh, that got into Berlin first. And um, uh, I think a lot of Reich Chancellery uh, uh, silver pieces are still in Russia, so we didn't get uh, a lot of them, but we have some of them. So I'll show you what, what they look like. Um, I have a, a set here. Um, the Rice Chancellery items are exactly like the uh, Berghoff items. They were all made by Wellner, um, the same pattern exactly. Uh, this is a, um, a coffee pot, and if you look at it, uh, you can see that it has a, um, uh, an eagle on it, but the eagle is slightly different than the formal pattern eagle, in that the formal pattern's wings are out more whereas the wings on this eagle are closed. But if you also look at it, you'll see it's not engraved. Again, it's um, rolled on there. And I'll show you the, the bottom where I believe it, uh, I don't know whether, yeah, 
Yeah, there we go. Uh, there's there's the maker Wellner. That's what you want to see in the model number and the content number and so forth. Again, you do not want to see engraving on these pieces. And uh, I've never cleaned them, so they're they're pretty dark with patina. Um, but I was I was very lucky in the 1980s. I was able to buy uh, all of this whole set except for the sugar bowl uh, from a veteran who brought them back. And um, uh, just a few years ago, a guy called me and says, Oh, I got a Hitler sugar bowl. Are you interested in it? And I says, Yeah, send me some pictures. And thought of it is it wasn't the same, exact same pattern, even had the same patina. And that's what you like to see. See the RK and the closed wing eagle? And then uh, when you open it up, it's still kind of shiny inside so, because it wasn't exposed to the air. So I was very thrilled to be able to uh, kind of complete my, my set with that. And one of the things that you'll see too that comes from both the Berghoff and, and the, uh, the Rice Chancellery, uh, most collectors don't know what that is. See it on both sides. And this opens up. Now do you know what it is? It's for squeezing a lemon. A very ingenious little part here. Uh, I don't know why we don't see them in America, because you put the lemon in there, close it, and push it, and you, you know, it comes out the top. A great little, great little piece. Um, some of the other things with this, uh, set. Uh, they're kind of interesting. Uh, this came with it, and uh, it took me years to finally figure out what it was. Um, uh, it's got the uh, it's got the eagle on it. If you can see it right there. Um, when I first got it, it looked to me like a, a hubcap from a 56 Chevy or something. Uh, but actually what it is, it's the top to a glass punch bowl. And you can see that probably being a very busy spot when the Rice Chancellery was entertaining. So, and there's some other pieces too, but I won't bother you with all of that. That stuff, but I think you get the, uh, the general idea uh, of what we see on that. Okay, we'll take a break for a minute. Okay, next we're going to uh, uh, look at some of the flatware that was owned by uh, Ava Braun, who of course everybody knows was um, uh, eventually Hitler's uh, bride, although it was the last day of his life. But, uh, uh, Ava had her own uh, apartment in the Berghof, and um, she had a lot of her friends over quite a bit, and uh, she needed um, silver service for that. And uh, uh, Speer wrote in his book, Inside the Third Reich, that uh, there were a number of um, silver companies that uh, sent Ava Braun um, silver for her use, probably hoping that they would gain uh, business by that. Um, so uh, it's pretty much up in the air um, just because you see a fork mark with EB on it, that doesn't mean it belonged to Ava Braun. Uh, but then again, maybe it did. But she may have had six, eight uh, sets of, uh, of flatware, we don't know. Uh, but what I can tell you, uh, back in the uh, uh, late 70s, I was at a show in Maryland, and a veteran came in with several Ava Braun pieces that he personally brought back from the Berghof. So I still have those pieces, and I'm going to show you them. And I know for certain that these are proper Ava Braun pieces. So you can take a look at these. The, um, the pattern 
is all the same if you look at the design and the uh, the ends of the of the different the four items uh, and they have the uh, EB uh, special monogram that was designed by Spear a lot of us call it the the butterfly monogram so these absolutely uh, are were Ava bronze no question about it um, uh, they, uh, I don't know the silver content. Oh, yeah, these are 800, so they were they were fine. Uh, and then additionally, um, I have a, a beautiful little, like a doily uh, that was Avis, um, beautifully um, uh, uh, sewn with her butterfly initial. Uh, and there's also a spoon here that's a, a different pattern. Uh, but you see it has the EB initial and the reason why I know it is real uh, is because this doily and spoon were given to um, Ava's girlfriend uh, Schneider her name was and this is a she had uh, Schneider over a lot and they were good friends those are pictures of her that's Ava here. Uh, that's Ava, and this is uh, Schneider here. But um, this came from Schneider's estate, along with letters that uh, that document it. Uh, so we know for sure that Ava also had this uh, fancy uh, monogram uh, pattern, also. So that's a, that's a good thing to know. Uh, before I leave Ava, and I've shown you this before, but this is one of my uh, my prized possessions. Uh, you can see it's a um, a crystal and silver ink blotter. You know, in the 30s they didn't have ballpoint pens yet. They wrote with uh, pen and ink, uh, and you needed a blotter to keep it from smearing. So this has. Um, a facsimile of Ava's signature on one end of the silver mount, beautifully done, and then on the other mount end of the silver, uh, it says Zumulfest 1943, Gretel und Hermann. Well, as you probably know, um, Gretel was Ava's sister, and Gretel was married to Hermann Fegelein. The great SS uh, Gruppenfuhrer and cavalry officer, and it says um, Yule Fest instead of Weihnachten, because the SS, being pagan, uh, did not acknowledge Weihnachten as Christmas. They called it Yule Fest. So this was a Christmas gift to Ava uh, from her sister and brother-in-law Hermann Fegelein. But what's really cool about it, it still has copies of her signature that she blotted. And when you put it in a mirror, you can clearly see Ava Braun there. It's really a, an incredible piece of history. I think it's a, a wonderful piece. So with that, we'll move on to another area. Okay, uh, next I want to talk about the... Uh, the Deutsche Bahnschutz, the railway system. And uh, most collectors know that uh, Hitler, as well as Goering, uh, had special trains to uh, cart them around Europe. And of course, the trains were uh, equipped as fine as you could do on a train uh, with flatware and serving pieces. Uh, so we don't see them too often, but once in a while we do, and I'm going to show you uh, some of the train pieces. Um, these are um, the Bonschutz pieces. They're always marked uh, DR uh, with an eagle and the DR initials. And um, there were two different patterns made for them. Uh, the one pattern, which is the most deluxe, uh, notice the end of it is is flattened, whereas these are the other pattern is rounded. 
when you see this flattened end, uh, these pieces are 800 silver, and they were only used in um, uh, Hitler's personal dining car. Uh, the other pieces are plated. Uh, and I'm going to mention something about plating at this point, too. Um, when you look at a piece, uh, I don't know whether the camera can catch it. Right, let me look at it myself here first. But um, you'll, you'll see that I, I, think, I think it says 90 on it someplace. The maker, Brookman, made them. Just say 90, Rob. Yeah. So what that means with, uh, when you see these, you'll see 90, 100, some 60, um, along with the maker. And what that means is that the piece is silver plated. It is not um, 800 silver, coin silver. Um, it was certainly practical to silver plate and nickel base piece because it would last a lot longer. So for functions where a lot of pieces were being used, often the Third Reich used plated fittings, plated um, uh, utensils. So only Hitler's personal car had the, um, the uh, all silver pieces. So these pieces that we see um, were plated but what's really cool about them, uh, we looked on this, uh, this fork, and you'll notice it's also stamped 241. And you think, well, what the heck is 241? Well, I have a list that I made out of uh, a great book by Mr. Yanis that I'll discuss a minute ago. But uh, 241 came from Goering's dining wagon. They individually stamped the pieces to identify where they came from. So if we look on each piece here, uh, this one is uh, 244. That piece uh, came from Hitler's dining car. See the 244 there? And each piece here is, is individually marked with the number of the, of the uh, car it came from. Uh, this one is, um, what is it, 220, oh, two, I can't see what it is, uh, uh, 232, is that correct? Yeah, 232. And that also came from Hitler's train uh, from one of his um, uh, bed wagons, you know, where the berths were. Uh, this piece is marked um, two forty three. Two forty three came from Goering's uh, uh, dining wagon and so forth. So you can see if you can find these pieces you can actually pinpoint uh, where they came from and there, there's two great books by James Yanis that detail all of these things. They're tremendous books. They're not expensive and it's something you want to get if you want to think about collecting flatware. They're wonderful. So along with the, uh, the bond shirts, um, we also find some other things that are in, involved with it. Here's, here's a, uh, a bond shirts uh, nutcracker. Pretty rare item. I like it a lot. And uh, uh, also, here's a, um, 
a bottle top for a whiskey bottle. Voices Reichsbahn, DR, and the top just, uh, I guess, flip, yeah, flipped up, and uh, there you go. And then one other thing, uh, this is a, um, a little teapot, and it's got the gold eagle. It's a porcelain made by Nymphenburg, the best, with the DR on it. Uh, and then when you look on the bottom of it, there we go, 231. That comes from Hitler's personal dining car. So this was a teapot that was used for Hitler's dinners. And what's interesting about it, uh, you see there's two little niches here. And probably, uh, if, you have, if you've ever seen a tea sieve, remember they didn't have tea bags yet. You put the sieve on the top of this, put the tea in, and pour the hot water through the tea sieve. So this was like a little individual serving that was the perfect size for a train. A very, very valuable item here. You just never, never see these kind of things. So with that, we'll go on to another era. Okay, next we're going to talk about uh, Reich Marshal Hermann Goering. Uh, everybody knows uh, Goering was uh, flamboyant, uh, the second in command, and uh, uh, the people loved him right, right to the end, even when he cheated the hangman and took cyanide. But uh, uh, because of his um, uh, attachment to what they called uh, the, Her the Goering Works, which uh, basically gave him a salary from just about every factory in every country that Germany had occupied, along with his salary as a Reich Marshal, a, a Jaeger Marshal, all this. But Gary went on to become one of the most wealthy men in the world. And of course, he was a great collector. He loved art. Uh, one of the stories that always amuses me, uh, he, uh, he had some really uh, great works of art, and uh, he dealt with European dealers to obtain a lot of these. Uh, some he probably bought uh, from places he shouldn't have, but um, when they were, uh, uh, when Goering was um, interred in Nuremberg waiting his trial, um, one of his friends came in and, uh, and told him that uh, one of his prized works of art, the one he liked the most, uh, was a forgery. And he said that Goering was more distraught about this than he was about the trial. So I thought about that and I thought, well, gee, that's, that's kind of like us, isn't it? If we had our prized possession, the best thing we ever bought, had it for years, and then found out it was a phony. So this can happen to anybody, even even to Goring, you just have to move on. But anyhow, Herman, Herman had tons of, uh, of silverware and cutlery and, and uh, glassware and uh, just uh, immense amounts of things, so I can't show you everything. Uh, but one of the best um, sets of Goring flatware that I have been able to find uh, is right here. I have four pieces, uh, and these, if Robbie can get the camera up, you'll see the uh, Goering coat of arms on the, uh, the handles. Uh, and these, this flatware is absolutely astounding, the best you'll ever see. It's French made, uh, and it was all discovered in a, uh, a case that uh, was in one of Goering's cars with a lot of his um, hunting things. So I managed to get these four pieces, but they're really quite beautiful. Uh, really, really uh, outstanding uh, design. Um, this is a, a nice tray that has the Reich Marshal Eagle engraved into it. This one's engraved, it's not rolled, uh, but I believe it's authentic. It's very, very nice. 
kind of like a little candy tray or maybe a tray they used to put a card on when somebody was visiting. Um, this is a, uh, a Goering uh, cigar cutter uh, that comes from uh, his yacht, the Karen II, which was named after his first wife. Uh, and it was given to him for use on on the Karen too. And then something that kind of goes with it that I like a lot in my personal collection. Uh, this is a wine cooler that was also on the Karen too. And uh, I guess the salt water has gotten to some of it and I've never cleaned it. Uh, but you can see Karen II there engraved and the Reich Marshal Eagle on the top of it. So I don't, I don't think there was more than one of those made, so I think that's a, a pretty good thing. I often think, wow, maybe I should clean it. It would look glorious, but ah, I don't want to wear it away any more than it is. So you'll see, you'll see tons and tons of uh, Herman Goering um, things. And each one has to be looked at because they, they do duplicate uh, a lot of the things. You'll see a lot of utensils that are stamped with the arm and the ring, and you wonder, well, is it original? If you don't know where it came from, it's, um, it's very difficult to tell, especially if it's done right. Um, but what I'm showing you, I believe, is all to be uh, correct things. So next we'll go to another era. Okay, collectors, I, I hope I'm not boring you to tears, but uh, I'm doing the best I can. So next we'll go to uh, uh, this set of uh, flatware. Uh, these three pieces, uh, they come from Klesheim Castle. Uh, Klesheim Castle was across the border from Bavaria in Austria, and it was used to house and entertain uh, dignitaries. And uh, we see quite a bit of flatware that comes from it. And if you look at it, it has a special eagle. Uh, and again, um, the pieces of uh, Klesheim that I have in my personal collection, uh, I bought directly from a veteran, and I know that that's where they came from because he told me and for years, uh, whenever we'd see this pattern being sold in auctions and so forth, uh, it was identified as uh, being uh, Hitler's lawyer's uh, uh, silverware. And uh, uh, Mr. Yanis, in his first book, also uh, identified it as Hitler's lawyer, who was Hans Frank. Um, and I wrote to him and said, no, uh, I'm sorry, but you're wrong about that. It comes from Castle Klesheim. And Mr. Yanis uh, took a trip to Germany with his wife a few years ago, and Castle Klesheim still exists today. It's now a casino, beautiful place. And he went to see the uh, manager, and there were some long-term employees there, and they absolutely identified that pattern as coming from Klesheim Castle. So I felt good to be able to at least correct something that was a, uh, a misnomer. So uh, those are nice things to find. And then down here, um, this is the, um, the pattern that came from uh, Torrigan. Uh, what's the man's name? Um, do you remember his name, Rob? Sockle. Sockle, yeah. Fritz Sockle. Uh, he had a lot of flatware because he had a big um, uh, office and complex in Weimar. Uh, and people love this pattern because of the way that the uh, eagle's wings are shaped and all. It's really a, uh, a good-looking type. I like it a lot. Um, and the piece next to it here, this has yet to be formally identified, uh, but look at the wonderful eagle on it and how vaulted it is. And um, 
we're starting to believe that um, that this pattern uh, was in fact made for Hermann Goering's wedding in 1935. So that's still up in the air, but that's what it seems to be. So if anybody comes across one of those, uh, don't get rid of it. It could become uh, a very valuable thing. Um, looking up further here, uh, these pieces... Uh, um, these come from Velvisburg, Hitler's or Himmler's castle. If the camera can get in there, they're very interesting. They they have the uh, the mark of Velvisburg on them. You all know what Velvisburg was, where Himmler had his Knights of the Round Table and uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, so they're kind of neat to have. And and the one next to it is just a an SA knife, but it's the only one I've ever seen marked that way. See, it has the SA runes on it, just like on a dagger. It's kind of cool. All right, and we'll go around the other side of the table. Next, I wanted to show you uh, uh, Ribbentrop, uh, who, of course, was the, uh, the head diplomat that... Uh, signed the peace accord with, uh, with Russia in uh, 1940 so that they could uh, split up uh, Poland. Uh, of course, the Germans reneged on that when they attacked Russia. But the Ribbentrop pattern um, is 925 silver, the finest that could be produced. Um, and this, of course, was to make the right impression uh, on visitors um, uh, visiting Germany. And you can see the pattern is uh, got a nice um, a political style eagle and it's a little fancier than uh, most of the patterns that you see. And quite rare also. Very, very nice uh, items. Um, see if the camera can pick up. That's really small. Let's see. Uh, can the camera get that? You can see the um, the German hallmarks with the crescent and the eagle and the 925. Okay. All right, and we'll move over to the other side of the table now. Well, you've all heard of the uh, Deutsche Hof Hotel. Uh, this was the hotel in Nuremberg that was Hitler's favorite hotel in Germany. Uh, and the hotel was purchased by the, uh, the Nazi party in 1936, and it, it served as uh, Hitler's residence during the uh, apartheid tag uh, rallies every September, uh, and also Hitler stopped there quite a bit, so he had his own private suite there and so forth, and uh, uh, I'm sure he was a uh, treasured guest. But we see uh, a lot of neat uh, flatware that comes from the, uh, the Deutscher Hof. Um, this is a set of uh, five, actually six pieces that come from the uh, Deutscher Hof, and uh, uh, what you'll see on party-owned hotels, I don't know whether the camera can pick that up, but it's a, uh, a wreath around a swastika uh, on the one side, and then on the other side, uh, it has the name of the hotel there, Der Deutscher Hof. Probably upside down, but, the, but all, all of the flatware is marked that way. You get that, there's a table in the way. <laughs> and then there's uh, 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 like a, um, uh, a hot water tea pitcher. And you can see it has the name of the hotel on the side of it. And then on the bottom of it, it has the wreath and the 
and the swastika. Now you'll also see other um, NSDAP hotel um, things which we'll just have in German um, party owned hotel is where it'll say it won't have the name of it. Uh, the Deutsche Hop seems to be the only place where they they put the name on. Uh, here's a, a nice cream pitcher with the Deutsche Hop on it. And then on the bottom it has the uh, the wreath and the swastika. And then there's also a kind of an unusual piece. I like this. I like this piece a lot. Uh, it's a sugar tong, and uh, if the camera can get it, it says Deutscherhof on there. Cool thing. And then. From there, we'll go to uh, uh, some other stuff that uh, uh, is mostly uh, one-off, but um, the different Wehrmacht organizations uh, all had their own um, silver service, especially in the uh, officer corps. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting to see some of that, and uh, there's probably hundreds of uh, different patterns. You'll never find it all. You'll never collect it all. Uh, but I have a, a couple of pieces that I, that I can show you that I, I think are a little bit interesting. So we'll do that. Um, this, uh, this first piece I think is kind of, kind of terrific. Um, it has a, um, a Luftwaffe Eagle on the handle and you can see it looks like two spoons pressed together with holes in them but actually what it did if you, you move this little thing down and you open up you could put tea in there and then pour the water over the tea and you'd have a nice uh, nice brew there for you. Uh, the next piece is um, this is kind of a good one. It, just, it has a raised totenkopf on it. And uh, the skull is very well done, raised out of the, so you know it was stamped by a machine. Um, the next piece is um, an SS piece that, uh, it, it's from SS Das Reich. And then uh, the next piece we have is um, uh, this piece comes out of Dachau. Uh, I have a letter. I got about six pieces from uh, the family of the veteran, and there's a letter along with it that um, he was at Dachau and, and got these utensils there. Uh, this is the same thing is true here. And this, this next piece is, um, uh, it's marked uh, uh, LAH, which is Leibstandart, Adolf Hitler, and then uh, uh, the abbreviation LAZ, L-A-Z. Uh, Lazarette was a hospital, so this was used in the LAH hospital. Um, the next piece is just from an army regiment, but it has the uh, regiment um, uh, nomenclature stamped on it. It's kind of fun. It's a salad fork. And this next piece, I, I don't know where it's come from, but it's obviously from a, a political group. Uh, it has the political eagle on it. I've never seen another one like it, but I kind of like it. It's a high quality piece. And the last one here is, um, this is just a, a mess hall army knife uh, made out of aluminum uh, and it has the army abbreviations on it uh, with the army eagle. All right.
right, next I wanted to show you a, uh, a bowl. It's a very beautiful thing. Uh, it has the um, political eagle rolled onto the obverse. And if you look at it, look how the wings are uh, cut in at the top. Uh, that's what you see on this pattern. Uh, and it was only used uh, probably for the highest of the high. Um, I know that this pattern was also used in uh, uh, the pieces that Martin Borman had at Berchtesgaden. And notice it's rolled. It's not, Whitman didn't stamp it. So, uh, and it's also, uh, yeah, that's what you like to see. Wellner on the bottom. Um, so that, this is a very, very good, good, good piece. And then uh, uh, these are interesting also. Uh, there's two, two bowls. And um, if I get this right here. Yeah, two bowls. These bowls, uh, uh, they're quite beautiful, both in mint condition. And they come from the Fuhrer Bau. The Fuhrer Bau was the building in Munich where the 1938 Peace Pact was signed, uh, where uh, the English Prime Minister walked away waving the signature that we have peace for all. Uh, and then a month later, uh, <laughs> that was the end of it. But these are, these are quite rare because there weren't a lot, of, um, a lot of pieces at the Fuhrer Bow. Uh, lastly, uh, I want to uh, show you one of my uh, proudest uh, possessions for silver pieces and it's a tray and if Robbie can show you the tray it's a very very beautifully done and very impressive um, uh, we don't see many things that were personally given by Hitler they're very very rare Hitler didn't give out a lot of things he got a lot of things but he didn't give out many and uh, this one you can see has a tremendous uh, party eagle that appears rolled. And in fact, this whole inscription appears rolled. It doesn't appear uh, engraved. Um, and it's to SS Untersturmfuhrer Hans George Schulz. And in uh, English it says, for two years of loyal service at the Reich Kanzlei, Hauptquarter, which was Hitler's office, on 10 May 1941, Der Fuhrer, signature by Adolf Hitler. Um, Schulz was a SS officer who was one of Hitler's adjutants. They normally served for a two-year period, and apparently uh, the Fuhrer was particularly impressed uh, with the service that Schulz uh, gave uh, to him uh, and had this um, tray uh, made uh, to present to him uh, for his service. And it's interesting too that the tray is made out of al alpaca, not silver. So he liked the guy but <laughs> not, not enough to spend the money on, on silver. Um, I might also add that Hans George's name does not have an E after the G in George. That is incorrect. Uh, this piece originally was turned up uh, by a dear late friend of mine, Howard Krauss, from, he's a farmer from Iowa. And uh, Howard was very ingenious. Uh, he used to look up uh, the uh, American Army reunions in his area and he would slip in the door and uh, uh, be a member of the reunion and while he was there of course he turned up all kinds of things uh, this tray being one of them so the name is spelling I know it's from the Fuhrer how could that happen well I know of an SS Himmler birthday sword that has the recipient's name spelled wrong and let's face it the engravers did what was given to them so Mistakes did happen. Well, before we uh, before we wrap up uh, the flatware summary, we, we got to thinking 
Gee, I guess you guys would like to see at least one dagger after looking at all that silverware, for God's sake. So uh, we do have a surprise. Uh, just yesterday, uh, we acquired a dagger uh, from a man who's had it for 50 years, and it was given to him on his 16th birthday by his brother. Uh, and he's had it all these years, never touched it, and really didn't even know what it was, and thank goodness he contacted me and uh, uh, so now we're going to going to help him out with it but if you want to look at this dagger it's really something special not something you see very often uh, this collector's is a chained NSKK high leader dagger extremely rare uh, we see the uh, SA high leaders uh, a lot more frequently than we see one of these uh, it has beautiful cross guards that have never been cleaned. The tang nut has never even been out of the dagger. Uh, and the silver eagle, uh, fantastic. Um, the mass blade, the gilt is, is still just about 100% there. I'll show you the other side too of it. It's just incredible. There you have the uh, hewn line signature on the back, like we see with the NSKK honors, and the um, small icon trademark. Again, the beautiful all hand enhanced uh, cross guards, and the scabbard is leather covered, and they have a special fitting for the NSKK, which this one is all handmade, and then the chain is a beautiful all nickel chain which is much more delicate and impressive than a normal NSKK chain. The links are a little bit smaller and see how small the shield is on the clip uh, and they're unmarked because the RZM had nothing to do with this and other than a little bit of damage to the leather uh, from the years of wearing um, it's still all there and because it's still all there uh, it should stay that way. It'd be a shame for somebody to recover it. Um, but boy, what a what a terrific thing! I hope you like that. That's our our little surprise after this lecture, and at least you got to see one dagger anyhow. And it ain't just an SA or an Army dagger. So with that, uh, we'll uh, we'll conclude uh, this seminar. Uh, I forgot to give you the date. It's um, the 11th, I believe you said, of April. Um, just worth mentioning that uh, my father was born on that day, and uh, he would have been 103 years old today. So uh, uh, he's been going a while now, but I miss him. I guess everybody misses their father. Uh, but my thoughts are with him, and my thoughts are with everybody, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. It was a little long maybe and a little tedious, but we did the best we could and um, hopefully you got something out of it. And uh, keep writing me, send those emails if you like, and uh, as I always say, I'm, I'm happy to help you with anything if I can. So go on and uh, have a good spring and this uh, COVID is oh, just about over now. So uh, I haven't got my shots yet, but uh, Hopefully I'll come up soon. Okay, we'll see you all.